Hi everyone, I'm Alexandra. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you for tuning in, or if you're new here, welcome. Today, we are going to examine what scripture tells us about the mark of the beast. We're going to look at scripture together to be reminded of what God's word says. You can find my opinions about all of this in my other videos, but this one is just going to focus on scripture. Some people don't know where to start or have trouble starting. So, I hope this is a helpful and informal way to get involved with the word. This is a remastered version of my Mark of the Beast video from last year, but this one has voiceover and a lot of new content, so please stick around. Please have a Bible with you or a Bible website with the version you prefer to read for yourself as we go. I'm using the ESV and sometimes the KJV in this video for ease of reading only, but please study as many versions as you prefer. To begin, there are specific conditions based in scripture in context that need to be met in order to be the mark. These include, but are not limited to, identification of the first and second beasts in Revelation chapter 13, and understanding it's the second beast who brings in the mark, and that the mark is worldwide as it causes all, meaning all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive it, and it has to do with money, since one cannot buy or sell unless he has the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. With that being said, let's get started. We'll begin by reading all of Revelation chapter 13 together. We're going to look at the ESV that's on the screen, but please read any version you like. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power, and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a good example of why I like to use multiple translations to read and study. The King James translation of verse 10 is a little more clear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This verse is similar to Matthew 26:52, where Jesus says, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Basically, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. If you take captives, you'll be taken captive. He then explains the opposite of those who commit criminal activities are the saints, those who follow the commandments of God and who have faith in Jesus. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak, and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell, unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. 
This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So there are two beasts, the first and the second. I have discussed these two beasts in various videos in my channel, especially part 3 of the mind game series, as well as the concept of Antichrist in the Antichrist investigation. If you haven't seen those yet, links are in the description if you're interested. In short, the Antichrist investigation explores the origins of the original meaning of Antichrist found in the epistles of John, and the modern interpretation of the Antichrist created by commentary and occultists. The video discusses the first beast of Revelation 13, including the etymology of the son of perdition and the angel of the bottomless pit. We also touched on the doctrine of dispensationalism and how it created the modern notion of Antichrist. Please check that out before continuing. Now, that aside, let's check out scripture. So, what about the mark of the beast? As we already read, Revelation chapter 13, 16 through 18 says, Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Revelation 15.2 tells us it is possible to have victory over the mark. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. This verse specifies all the things that represent the beast that must be overcome the image, the mark, and the number of his name. Remember to read the entire chapter in context and don't just isolate verses 16 through 18. The Greek third person pronoun is translated differently in various versions. The King James Version uses the pronoun he for the beast. The English Standard Version uses it or its. In each case, the third person pronoun refers to the beasts which we just described. Revelation 13.16 in the King James Version says people will receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Other translations say on the right hand or on the forehead. Here's a sample of various versions. The ones underlined in green say the mark is on the right hand or forehead. The King James Version says in. The word on that is in both verses and says on their right hand or on their foreheads and describes the mark is the Greek word epi. It is Strong's Concordance number G1909, which means to superimpose or to layer on top of. Strong's KJV Concordance shows that the word in, most other versions say on, which is G1909, comes from the Greek word epi, which means superimposition of time, place, or order. As a relation of distribution, as in over or upon, the Hebrew Strong's says upon, on, at, by, before, amongst these others. To superimpose something means to place or lay over or above something. The word epi means the mark is placed on or upon you. The Greek word chiragma is used for mark in Revelation 13, 6 through 17. It has both a literal, as an engraving, etching, and a figurative translation as an undeniable identification, like a symbol giving irrefutable connection between parties. We can look at scripture to understand scripture. Notice the location of this mark, the right hand and forehead. This is specific placement. The Bible tells us many times about having a sign on your hand and your forehead. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Deuteronomy 11.18 says, 
Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. One powerful example found in Ezekiel chapters 8, 9, and 10 describes a vision Ezekiel had of God passing judgment on the unfaithful and evil people of the house of Judah. However, the righteous people who are crying over the corruption that had permeated Judah were marked by God on their foreheads and spared from destruction. It is important to appreciate the entire context of these three chapters. God's mark was placed on the righteous and was a spiritual mark. Please pause the video and read these three chapters on your own before continuing. Okay, now Exodus 13.9 says, And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. And Exodus 13.15-16 says, and it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thine hand, and for frontlets between thine eyes, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. The English Standard Version uses the word mark in Exodus 13, 16. In each case, God is telling us to keep His word and commandments bound as a sign, token, or mark on our hand, and that His word will be as frontlets between our eyes or our forehead. Keeping His word as a sign demonstrates our allegiance to Him or taking His name. According to Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew word for sign or token is H226 or the Hebrew word oth which translates to sign, token, enzyme, miracles, and mark. It might be worth noting that in Ephesians 1, 13-14, it says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1.13 says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Strong's Concordance shows that the word sealed is also mark. The word sealed is also translated as mark. God uses these placements to remind us where to keep his word, in our minds and our actions. God's word in our forehead, our mind, where we make decisions. God's word in our hand, our actions, what we do. Revelation 22.4 says they will see God's face and his name will be on their foreheads. God's name is on their foreheads because they are married or belong to God. They took his name and are part of the kingdom of heaven. They did not take the name of the beast and are not part of Lucifer's kingdom. Taking someone's name refers to marriage. The relationship between God and his people is described throughout scripture using the analogy of a marriage. For example, the betrothal contract or covenant between God and the Hebrews was the Ten Commandments, which are found in Exodus 20, 1-17. After telling the Hebrews to have no other gods before him, and that they should not make any graven images of anything on earth or bound out to other gods, God says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. In the entire context of what is happening at Mount Sinai, God is telling them not to marry him and take his name if they don't intend to be faithful to him. Given that Exodus describes the betrothal of God to the Hebrews, the wedding theme is continued in the New Testament. Believers in Jesus, or the church, are referred to as the Bride of Christ. Jesus himself alludes to the fact that he is the bridegroom. This is seen in Matthew 9, 14-15. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Ephesians 5, 25-27 also compares the church to a marriage, saying, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In John 14, 1-3, 
Jesus refers to the ancient Hebrew tradition of the groom going to prepare a home for his new bride, shown here. Scripture shows us in Revelation 19, 7-9 that the marriage supper of the Lamb is held after Jesus returns to get his bride, the people of God, the people who took his name, the elect from every race and nation. Revelation 19, 7-9 explains, Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. We either have the mark of God or the mark of the beast. Each indicates ownership. Who do you belong to? The mark of the beast is twofold. It is the name of the beast and or the number of its name. Revelation 13, 17-18 tells us there are two parts that make up the mark of the beast. We discussed the first, the name of the beast. This affects those who are not sealed by God. The second portion affects everyone, the number. Revelation 13, 17 states that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. The mark is the name of the beast or the number of the beast. Now, let's look at the number. Revelation 13, 18 says, This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. The Greek word used in this verse for man, human, or mankind is anthropos, which means man-faced, as in a human being, certain man. The Hebrew Strong's agrees. It says that is, a human being, whether male or female, generically, to include all human individuals, to distinguish man from beings of a different order, like from animals and plants, God and Christ are angels. There are two places in the Bible that relate the number 666 to a man or the word anthropos, 1 Kings 10.14 and 2 Chronicles 9.13. 1 Kings 10.14 says, now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. And 2 Chronicles 9.13 says the same thing. Both of those verses are referring to King Solomon. Deuteronomy 17 outlines the laws God laid out for kings. These laws prohibit the multiplying of property such as horses, wives, silver, and gold. Some of the highlighted verses say, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother, but he shall not multiply horses to himself. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. First Kings chapter 10 begins by commending Solomon's knowledge, but then shows his downfall because he began violating the rules of God set up for kings by multiplying gold, 666 talents a year, multiplying horses, chariots, and wives. He also built places of worship for false gods. All of these ended up turning his heart away from God. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Solomon broke the first commandment by worshiping other gods. Solomon broke the contract he had with God by breaking the first commandment. Solomon took God's name in vain. I'm not sure why some people have made Solomon into a celebrity, but the Bible tells us that, in the end, he was not someone to look up to. 
The number 666 is associated with Solomon and his gold, his abuse of power, his greed, and his apostasy. Some of the groups who view Solomon as a celebrity are the occult societies. Solomon and his temple are fundamental to not only Freemasonry, but all of the magical systems, the mysteries, such as the occult, the Kabbalah, demonology, and more. According to Universal Masonry, Freemasonry as we now see it, organized into lodges and degrees, with grandmasters, masters, and wardens, with the same ritual observances, was first devised by Solomon, king of Israel, and assured its position as a secret society during the period when that monarch was engaged in the construction of the temple of Mount Moriah. King Solomon's temple is a symbol of Freemasonry. References to the construction of Solomon's temple at Jerusalem have been included in the rituals of the operative Freemasons since ancient times. In chapter 3 of Revelation, Jesus is talking to the lukewarm church of Laodicea. They thought they were rich because they had worldly goods, but Jesus says they're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Their lukewarm faith makes him sick. Jesus tells them how to be truly rich, and it has nothing to do with money. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. The buying of gold referred to by Jesus is worship, or spiritual. In return, we are rich because we're given white garments or washed clean. The Bible repeatedly warns us about the dangers of the love of money. Here are some examples. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Hebrews 13.5 Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew 6.24 No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Luke 12.15 And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. James 4, 13-17 Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, and spend a year there, and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time, and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. In 1 John 2.15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Matthew 4.9 shows us Lucifer's strategy, and Jesus shows us the example of how to respond. All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. In the context of 1 King 10.14 and 2 Chronicles 9.13, 666 refers to gold and to an incredible amount of wealth. Remember, God gave Solomon what he needed. One of the things that drove him away from God was his love of money. Solomon had money, but he wanted wealth. Revelation chapter 15.2 adds one more aspect that we must overcome. The beast, its image, and its number. The only way to overcome these is by rejecting all they offer and keeping Jesus and God's word first. Revelation 14.12 tells us how. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What is the defense against the mark of the beast? According to Revelation, it's obedience to the commandments of God and the testimony of faith of Jesus. God will never leave us or forsake us, and his grace is enough no matter what life throws at us. So stand strong and be wise. Look carefully then how you walk, as in how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. In Matthew 28, 20, And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. God will get us through whatever comes. So keep your eyes on God, and rebuke the devil when fear comes upon you. We are blessed and fortunate to get to live during the time the prophets saw and wrote about. The Bible is alive. 
Don't forget the big picture. The return of the king. Jesus Christ is coming back. And there is nothing more important and awe-inspiring than knowing he is so near. This is reason for hope and peace. This is also a reminder to sincerely seek God and turn away from the sinful things of this world. Jesus will provide for you and take care of you. He is trustworthy and his words are true. So focus on his words, not on the fear and the chaos around you. Be set apart, be still, and know that he is God. Thank you all for watching this video. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.